In Melbourne, a notorious Australian is claiming back some ancestral territory. There's a possum in my house. <laughs> For anyone not used to wildlife, it's a nightmare. It sounded like Jurassic Park. It sounded like a dinosaur from Jurassic Park. For others, it's a romantic dream. It's just such an incredibly fulfilling experience to watch how intricate their little group is. The community is taking sides. This sort of filthy little critter in my roof was not welcome. It's really not their fault that they're a possum. Clever and resourceful, possums are bringing the authorities to their knees. How we deal with troublesome native animals, because that's what they are. <laughs> Melbourne's in the grip of a possum plague. We've probably got the highest density of brush-tailed possums per square metre in the country. And that's just crazy, because the park cannot support that. This is a story of some possums and some people and how their lives collide on a city battlefield. Three kilometres from the centre of Melbourne sits a much-loved pocket of parkland, Curtin Square, a green haven in the concrete jungle. It's filled with ancient elms planted over a century ago. In a nest box, high in one of these stately trees, is one of Australia's great survivors, snoozing. She's the park's possum matriarch, an old mum. Her family can be linked back to fossils over 25 million years old. She's a brush-tailed possum and nocturnal. We'll need infrared cameras to see some of the dramas. She's 14, ancient for a possum. In the bush, possums normally live to about eight. Maybe city life has advantages. Remarkably, our possum pensioner has a baby in her pouch. It was born about three months ago, the size of a pea, and won't leave his mum for another three months. In a nearby elm is last year's daughter. She's been on her own for the last two months, kicked out to make way for mum's new baby. Most possums die at this age, evicted and homeless. Every tree hole is already occupied. There are a lot of possums here, and they're very territorial. A possum will make clear the ownership of trees and branches with smelly markers. Each has a gland on their chin, chest, and also near its bottom. Cross a line, and your neighbor screams at you. This is high-density city living, possum style. They even have their own social workers. The possums are followed by scientists and local residents. They have named the teenage daughter Scamp, and the old matriarch is affectionately known as Mumsy. Her baby is called Buster. Now, have you guys got any specific questions? No. Zoologist Kath Handerside and two of her students are trying to count the possums living in Curtin Square. Two there and they're within a metre of each other. So there's one out here as well. OK. So have we got three to the left then? Yep. And then this is a... Brushy. And oh, there, right. there's one. No, that's a third one. Oop, there goes a flying fox. Do not look up with your mouth open, team. There are probably quite a few in here that we're not seeing. There's a set. There was two in that left tree, not one. So what's our tally, Batman? Oh, OK. Um, and eight, nine, ten, thirty-seven. 40, 41, 45, 46. That's yeah. a hell of a lot of animals in, what is this park, about 100, 100 metres across? That number means the possum population density is three times greater than similar parks in the area and ten times more than anything found in the wild. Marsupials are declining all over Australia, yet here, in Melbourne, Mumsy and her friends are taking over. Mm. 
Michael and Matt Eliza. Morning, Michael. Good morning, John. Look, uh, these possums have nearly driven me out of my house. A lot of my friends come over and at night they marvel at the possums crawling across at my trees. But in the morning, I have to clean up all the uh, possum shit. This possum was sitting on my veranda. It was the size of Marlon Brando when he died. Uh, when it rains, I can smell the possum piss. His arms were folded and it was going, mmm, yum, yum, yum. Depends on me mood. Some nights I say, bugger, and I come out and I hose them, and then I end up all with water. And then another night I say, oh, stuff them, you know. <laughs> he was uh, something of an urban terrorist who sought to get into my house. He somehow got down the chimney and he spent two days in the house and John, the mess you should have seen it. And so I filled up the big wheelie bin with water and I gave a little prayer to it and I told it I was terribly sorry and I drowned it and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Possum killer. Don't try this at home. Possums are a protected native species and possum killers can face a $5,000 fine. City nurseryman Simon Collings offers some legal alternatives. If you want to wage war on possums, there are about three ways you can do it. The first one's the mechanical way, and you know, you say if it's a special tree, ban the tree, stop them climbing up, and then you can put protectors on top of your fence. And it has, I've seen that work in a couple of things, but it can make your place look a little bit like Star Lake 7A. Then there's chemical warfare, which is basically the, the spray on deterrent. The other form of warfare is um, electronic warfare. But they're activated by movement, so you get a strobe light coming on when the possum comes past. You get a high-pitched ultrasonic signal, which is a deterrent to pretty much all animals that can hear it. Passive infrared, ultrasonic, sonic, flashing strobe, safe, convenient, versatile, effective, humane. You know, it does everything. You know, well, according to the box. And if all that fails, there is always the Made in China Plastic Owl. <laughs> Possums are generally too smart to be defeated by fake birds and smelly sprays. So business is booming for licensed possum hunters who guarantee to get the job done. Here in Melbourne, there are over 30 professional possum removalists. A one-man operation for 20 years, Paul the possum catcher is inundated with calls. Does it sound like you have a baby elephant up there? Oh, shocking. Yeah, shocking. Look, for some people, it's just the knowledge that there is an animal living in the roof. That will do it. Other people will put up with it um, to, to much greater degrees. Um, but, you know, there's sleep issues, there's scaring the children issues, there's, I don't know, disease issues, smell issues, they're destroying the garden, I don't know. Some people just hate them. A normal day for Paul Notch involves travelling to about 10 jobs around Melbourne. His battle plan is not to kill, but to evict. Yep. First Paul locates and then blocks the possum's entrance to the roof cavity. He then installs his own cunning invention, a one-way escape chute that allows the possum to leave the roof at nightfall, but not get back in at dawn. Often the possums will nest in the bedrooms, which is where the people sleep. The possum doesn't want to be disturbed by talkback radio, by television, by your clothes washer. The quiet parts of the home are usually the computer room and the, the bedroom, and so that's where they settle. Up yes. there, oh, that's, yes. there's one standing up. Yes. He wouldn't leave. I no. was banging and making a noise. It actually sounded like he was lifting a tile to let them in. Oh, good, eh? <laughs> it fell down a chimney. It's happened three times. Yeah. Uh, I think it's dead now because it's not making any more noise. You couldn't tell from ground level. Yeah. But here, look that. Yep. They've chewed this. They've chewed this. You can see all the paw prints here. They're, the fur, they're hanging onto the wire here. 
right. onto this ledge, twisting and and in. Back at Curtin Square, the park's possums at least live in the trees and are even looked after. For local resident Raya Linden, they are her extended family. Mumsy! Mumsy! I have so much respect for Mumsy. She's a survivor. She's unbelievably strong against the odds. She's lost her tree, she's had a baby every year and managed to rear it. Yeah, she's a good role model for women everywhere, I think. There you go. Raya has fed the possums for the last 12 years. Yeah, where are you? Despite serious opposition, most nights she brings bags of fruit and grain. These are organic raw oats, and in them we've got grapes, pear, we've got carrot and apple. Raya is part of a local animal support group, worried that the possums don't have enough natural food. If we didn't feed them and if we didn't collect the rubbish that people live around, like bits of maccas and pizza and what have you, they'd just end up getting very, very sick. So th the reality is that if we don't feed them, they starve. But with all this extra food, the possum population has been steadily growing. Mumsy and her family also do find natural food. They devour the much-loved elms. Residents complain they are killing the very trees that house them. The local Yarra Council is forced to act. A meeting is held to try and solve the possum problem. The last time I think we had a report, there were six of the mature elms, you know, 150-odd elms, that had died as a result of the overpopulation of possums in the park. My predecessor and his predecessor before him have all been involved with this particular issue. I think there's a, a long history of it in, in the city of Yarra, and particularly Curtin Square, and, and I think it is interesting that it's to a very large extent been contained to Curtin Square, and so clearly it's becoming part of what we do, whether we like it or not. If something is not done, what we will lose is we will lose all of the trees, and then there will be nowhere for the possums to live. And that is not a win for the possums at all, and it is not a win for the community. It is not a win for anyone in Melbourne to see that happen. Where the choice is trees or possums, the trees seem to be winning. The council considers introducing a radical program to stop the possums, like Mumsy, ever breeding again. The plan is expensive and controversial. Melbourne's in the grip of a possum plague and experts have now come up with a novel way to try to beat the furry fiends. Margaret Decker is at Carlton's possum-infested Curtin Square. Margaret, what's this plan all about? Well, Peter, the law states you can't move a possum from its natural habitat and culling has been ruled out. The city of Yarra is looking for a new approach where possums will be caught, implanted with a contraceptive chip and then released. It's big news for Curtin Square's possums, and Raya is firmly against this proposal as unnecessary and cruel. Ultimately, it'll be a disaster for the possums, and we won't abandon them. It comes down to that. As the war of words grows, pressure starts to mount on the park's possums. So many possums are living unnaturally close to each other, and normal wild behaviour is changing. They're not naturally aggressive animals, they're naturally territorial animals. Most of the fights are about territory. The thing about possums is that it's pretend fighting. They make a lot of noise. They wouldn't fight to the death or anything. So there's a lot of posturing going on, a lot of body language. The fights can occasionally cause injuries, and Raya tends to the wounds to stop them from getting infected. It's a possum bite. It's been caused to drive this possum away from the den and from the tree um, as the territory diminishes. And the reason the territory is diminishing is the trees are being cut down, so there's fewer and fewer trees. And the mothers with the babies have priority. 
Mumsy's daughter Scamp could try and grab another possum's home, but her instinct is against violence. So she takes the most dangerous decision of her life. Scamp leaves Curtin Square. Even getting out means crossing another possum's territory. She's never left the park before. Most brush tail possums don't travel further than 50 metres away from their dens. Scamp knows nothing about fences and cars. From now on, she'll live on her wits. She's entered the alien world of garden walls, rubbish bins and possum catches. Spring arrives to Melbourne. A new growth appears in the parks and gardens. Rainbow lorikeets visit Curtin Square, gathering nectar from the flowers. The lorikeets also keep an eye out for any possible nest sites. Not a chance. The tree hollows are already occupied by possums. They hold up asleep till sunset. Mumsy's baby, Buster, is now five months and clings to her back. Possums have human-like hands with an opposable thumb for holding onto branches and to Mum's fur. If the council's radical plan goes fully ahead, these babies will be the last for the mothers in the park. Over the next month, Buster will alternate between the security of Mumsy's pouch and learning the skills needed to survive in the city. Buster is becoming independent, trying everything, learning. In the pouch he fed only on milk. Now the precious elm buds are his first solid food. Heaven on a stick. Buster ventures a little further each day. He has lots to learn and not a lot of time before he too will be off on his own. That's what worries his biggest fan. Most of the juveniles die. They die in their first year after they emerge from the pouch. You know, say for the sake of argument, 12, or 12 to 14 babies emerged last spring. We'd be lucky to have two or three still alive. But it seems there are still enough possums coming through the ranks to cause havoc. This inner city childcare centre could be an attractive home for a possum-like scamp. Most mornings, this is our regular routine of sweeping up the possum poo so the children have a clear yard to play with. We can't just leave things in the morning. We've got lots of little children and little children put things in their mouths and um, we don't want possum poo to be one of the things that they put in their mouths. A possum has been devouring the prized playground plants. This is kind of upsetting, I have to say, because it's just, you know, it's just massacred. He's not just having a nibble here and there. Obviously for a childcare centre there are some things we can't try so we're not um, we, we need to be very careful, for example, about what kinds of sprays we might use on plants. We have tried Worcestershire sauce on this, but that didn't seem to make a huge difference. It just made the garden smell like a barbecue. Has he got a name? No. <laughs> no, I'm not going down that path. <laughs> to get into the roof cavity, a possum has remarkably eaten its way through the ventilation louvers. Contractors need to install a mesh, effectively blocking all access. But the possum could now be trapped inside. Enter Paul the possum catcher. 
It should be a straightforward job. The one-way chute Paul places in the roof will allow the possums to leave tonight, but not get back in. At least that's the plan. Springtime is the busiest time for Victoria's Wildlife Rescue Centre, as adventurous young possums get themselves into all sorts of trouble. Okay. Okay. Depending on his age as well, he might have been um, riding on his mother's back. He could have fallen off or something could have happened to um, him. At the moment, we him. have got a huge Wrap amount of possums coming in into here. It's pretty much raining possums. Got... It's from here that volunteer animal rescuers are sent out. Jody and Chris have a house full of rescued baby possums, mostly baby Buster's age. You don't let them have control of the, of the nozzle or they'll spray it everywhere. No. Babies sometimes fall off their mother's back and are hurt, or maybe the mother's killed. You make a bit of a mess. Only the lucky possums end up here. But looking after them is exhausting. Six o'clock feed, clean the cages, um, home from work, feed them again. And as you feed them, because they're little, you have to take them to the toilet as well. Sterilise all the bottles in between feeds. And then there's a nine o'clock feed, a midnight feed, which Chris did, and then I got up and did the 3 a.m. feed. But it, it's quite tiring. But I, once you get into it, you sort of get into a rhythm and it's, you, you're sort of just doing it like a robot. I guess it's just second nature after a while. Tonight, Jody and Chris are attempting to reunite an over-adventurous baby with its mother. This one, called Beetle, is only three months old. It was found trapped inside a wall cavity and needs to be back with its mum. Mother possums aren't too worried by a youngster's strange new smell. Even if the baby has spent several days in human company, they recognise them just by their voice. So we're just trying to get her to call, which means making her a little bit distressed, feeling vulnerable, feeling cold. So she's calling her mum now. So we're hoping that the brush tails that we saw over in that tree, there are the parents that have moved off for the night and that they'll be alerted by her calls and come to investigate. There we go. So with a bit of luck, the mum will be coming back. Just watch yourself. Just don't get kind of stressed. Is that awesome? Yeah, it's coming down. It's coming? Yeah. All right. comes to claim the orphan. It's disappointing, but it was worth a try. I guess we're going through this sort of reuniting thing just because um, it can save a lot of work, plus the fact that there's an established territory here. So this way, you know, if they get, grow up with mum, they get taught the ropes. And even if we do the perfect thing in terms of aviaries and wild browse and, you know, plants and don't have contact with them at all, it's still not the same as living outside. So yeah, it'd be better if you got back to mum. Oh, you don't want to, they like being cupped. It's kind of like a pouch, isn't it? It's two days since Paul the possum catcher put up the escape chute at the childcare centre, but the staff is worried that a possum is still in the roof. How do we know he's not getting out? Because there's no possum poo. No, big no possum, possum droppings poo. outside, none of the big no, stuff. The little ones. Only yeah? The oh, ones, there you go. Not the big ones. Yeah, OK. So he's staying in then? Yeah. He's staying in because he can stay in. Yeah. It's and he's, making a big, he's making a bit like he's sort of clawing and making a lot of noise and like trying to chew his way out somewhere. Mm. He knows once he goes out through the chute, because you've had the other work done, he's going to be locked out for good. So it's safer to stay in and try and chew his own way out somewhere, perhaps. <clears throat> so what I need to do is to encourage him to leave. 
This is a battle of wits, and Paul is a bit of a possum psychologist. He installs a second one-way chute just in case the possum is trapped in a separate part of the roof. After leaving behind a tempting piece of fruit, Paul then does something rather strange. I'm arousing the possum's curiosity by banging in the roof, the possums with their directional hearing, and very good hearing at that, will detect that there's the banging coming from within the roof, not on the outside, but from within the roof. The sound waves, they'll pick up, and tonight they will emerge from their nest and go over to investigate the source or area of where that banging has, was occurring. And in doing so, they will then, without doubt, again, tonight find that chute. An evicted possum isn't much of a solution. An alternative and safe home is needed. Maybe we could, uh, put one up here. So Paul scouts around for a suitable tree to place a nest box for a newly stranded possum. It'll have to be nice and high. You see this? They're not standing straight. They're angled. It's much easier for a cat to get up there. We'll have a look out the front. I did see something. That's a possibility. By law. Possums can only be released 50 metres from where they're caught. The nest box has to be close. Well, it's a noisy street. This tree, well, let's face it, it's going to lose its leaves in, in winter. So a lot of the year, it's, uh, the box is going to be exposed to, look, what's here, it's, it's a street light directly next door. So, you know, there's just no, nothing, nothing around here. With no luck putting up a nest box, any possum that emerges tonight will find themselves at dawn without a home, a vagrant with nowhere to go. Now it's just a matter of wait and see. But the centre's cavernous roof has been harbouring a surprising secret. Two possums. Our adventurous park refugee, Scamp, cautiously follows her new friend out into the night. She looks healthy and well fed. While we need high-tech night cameras, Scamp can see everything easily. But the one-way escape chute now blocks the way back into the childcare centre's roof. With no nest box to move into, Scamp is once again homeless. Possums are not the only native Australian animal to successfully adapt to city living. Only seven kilometres from the CBD, fruit bats are making a good living nesting near a riverbank. Up to 20,000 of these flying foxes originally inhabited the botanical gardens close to the city centre. The flying foxes were considered a pest and in the 1980s, they'll moved to a new out-of-town colony. Mass wildlife relocations can work with bats, but few other examples are successful. It's extraordinary that any wildlife can cope in cities. Human beings are tough to get along with. The fruit bats fan out across Melbourne, searching for flowers and fruit trees.
Next to the exhibition building are the classical gardens. In spring, the fig trees provide a feast. Possums live here, eating the leaves and flowers too. But unlike the fruit bats, possums cannot be relocated. Not only is it illegal, but also possums dumped on a new area don't last long. There are 27 species of possum in Australia, and our brush tails are not the only ones that have adapted to city life. Two common ringtail possums are heading off in search of food. Ringtail possums are half the size of the brush tails and prefer to move along the aerial network of telephone and power lines. These are possum acrobats. Their tails are prehensile like a fifth hand and they're a lot lighter. Getting your nightly dinner is not without risk. One slip and it's a deathly drop onto the road below. Ringtail possums live in small family groups, unlike the more territorial brush tails. This group is known by locals as the Brighton Gang. They're off to discover the delights of the suburban garden. The gate-crashing gang are welcomed and fed by a few animal lovers. Party over, the ringtails head home to their shelter a dray made from leaves and sticks. As they go to sleep, other residents wake up and assess the possum damage. North Carlton. Today, the council is meeting again. On the agenda this time is the amendment of an existing law banning the feeding of all native animals. This law is directed squarely at Rhea and her supporters. I, I just have a concern that when we reviewed the park, the population of possum had been uh, raised on sustainable levels through feeding. So I really do wonder if we've got a balance here, and I think your situation may tip the balance in favour of having uh, no heritage trees and lots of possums in the park, and it's not, not a balance that everybody's in favour of. Council really needs to look at what the chronic causal factors have been in the trees decline rather than focusing and expending energy and money on going the possums when the possums are the victims here as well because if the trees go the possums are left with nowhere to live given that our brief is to um, advocate support and provide whatever help we can to animals including possums we will have to defy it so there'll be possum wars again in that park. There have been possum wars in that park before, and there will be again. Raya goes back to the possums, the centre of all this controversy. Despite the impending ban, Mumsy and Buster get their rations. They're not that comfortable on the ground. It's too dangerous. Brave as Buster appears to be, it's still reassuring to know that Mum is close by. He knows the safest place to be is inside Mum's pouch. If he'll fit. As possums adapt and thrive, so the forces against them are growing in strength and number two. The neighbouring council has taken drastic action. To protect their elm trees from possum attack, they've put up large steel bands around the trunks, effectively stopping possums from returning to the trees that they've lived in for generations. Here you go, grab that and run. Raya spots a stranded Someone possum. Said no. 
You can't get up there. See, this is what happens. Its instinct was to get its bit of food and climb the tree, but of course it, it can't. Raya calls in some animal activists to help out the stranded possum. Both sides are getting more extreme. It's harder to imagine a compromise now. Activists say they're fighting to stop a future possum slaughter. But lives are already being saved, one at a time. Beetle, the orphan brush tail baby in Jody and Chris's care, has become sick and requires urgent veterinary care. Good yourself? Yeah, pretty good. I only noticed this, like, last night. OK. So I think we've caught it. Oh, see? The stress of captivity or new food may have given her an upset stomach. Yeah. Suddenly I've just found poo everywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite It's got a very particular smell to it as well, so... Vet Tristan Rich is an expert in Australian native animals. I might, I'm going to make a quick smear and have a, yep. have a look. I'll use that, yeah. <laughs> It's a very glamorous job, isn't it? That's the other thing is, you know, she hasn't really seemed that great. And at first you thought maybe she lost her mum, a bit sad, but, you know, she really seems kind of slothful in a way. Yeah. So, yeah, there's quite a bit of yeast in here, which is... Um... There's a reason you have to have a licence to care for these things, because so many things can go wrong. You know, we still can't do as good a job as the mothers. Like, it's amazing, you know, you think these creatures live out in the wild. Every time you get one that's just come in off a mum, the little babies are so perfectly clean and you could never replicate that level of, or standard of mothering, really. But I'll try with a tissue. Clean off some of this. Three days later, and Beetle is in need of some alternative therapy. Oh, aren't you your pretty girl? Yes, you are. Her gut bacteria has become all out of balance, so Chris and Jody take Beetle to Nicola Vaughan, an expert in making up a potion, known in the trade as a poo milkshake. Yes, the poo milkshake, that is replacing the gut flora with good. These guys have been on antibiotics. They're prone to the bacteria and the yeast that live there growing out of proportion, yes. such as what happens with thrush. Yeah. So this is why we're going to make a, a lovely milkshake out of the day poo. <laughs> oh, nice and sticky. Love it. <laughs> It smells very earthy, actually. It smells more like dirt. Yeah. Here we go, buddy. Breakfast of champion. Mm. Melbourne is wide awake. But one of our gang of ringtails is trying to sleep. It's no easy trick for this creature of the night. just have to put up with it. Scamp has been living on the streets since her eviction from the childcare centre roof. Between the cats and the cars, the odds are stacking up against her. Scamp is a follivore, a leaf eater. But desperate possums will eat meat and bread from rubbish. She's getting increasingly unpopular in the neighbourhood. Homeless possums are problem possums. A sensible solution seems to be slipping farther away.
but there's always hope. Possums can flatten their body to squeeze into holes smaller than a tennis ball. A gap under someone's roof at number 26 opens up an opportunity for scam. Inside is possum paradise, unoccupied. Meanwhile, Chris wants to be able to return Beetle to the wild as soon as possible. But he'll need to teach the orphan how to be a wild possum. He's paired her up with the much more adventurous Styx, another orphan. They have different objectives in life, these two. <laughs> no. No. He's not a jumper yet, I don't think. He's a bit of a hanger. <laughs> I don't normally play with them too much, try not to, but they need a little bit. You can tell. Need something. I mean, they are quite needy, you know. They'll be in their mum's pouch a fair bit, so it's kind of sad that you can't deny them all contact. I mean, I think they must, to some degree, think of us as their parents or something similar. At Curtin Square, the possums are nervous. The warmer weather has brought out the dog walkers and a pet attack on a possum can be deadly. These are prey animals, they're not predator animals, so they don't have attack behaviour, they don't have aggressive behaviour, they've got preservation behaviour. And this noise is, is like, there's danger, take care. Possums like kangaroos get capture myopathy. I mean, they suffer stress to the extent where they have a heart attack. The doctors have to kill the possum for the possum to kind of collapse. And then it generally rolls over on its back and puts its claws up in a self-protective form of behaviour and the dog then will disembowel it. There's a few urban myths about possums scratching people's faces and scratching dogs, but we've never seen it happen. They are the victims. Much later, the possums cautiously clamber down to graze on the grass. The elm tree's buds and leaves have been seriously munched. Mumsy and Buster also venture down to search for something to eat. For the park's possums, this is becoming a more embattled world. People are not only attacking them through the law and the media, and cutting them off from their treetop homes, but now the pets are out to get them. Buster, keep close to Mum. Part of the park is reserved for off-leash exercising, and a couple of boisterous dogs spread fear among the possums. Mumsy and Buster just manage to scramble to safety. That monkey-like group of Buster is the only thing keeping him from certain death. There are casualties, stranded possums. Their only option is to wait it out until they can get back to the safety of their trees. Rhea's planning her next move to keep the possums fed. Yarra Council's plan will ban all feeding of native animals. She wants to use the upcoming council elections to apply pressure. 
the animal lovers are plotting their campaign. Is that we've really got a fairly critical time coming up, particularly in the city of Yarra. And I think suddenly now they're listening because we're in a position where we can perhaps influence voting preferences. And we're about to distribute a questionnaire to every single candidate who's standing to gauge their position on on the issues and I think unless we win this one and, and have possums fully accepted as protected native wildlife that can't be harassed and tortured and starved then we haven't got anywhere. Raya's group of activists hit the street. Standing. Raya Linden is the campaign director for Animal Act. defy the council by law and continue to feed the possums. We now feed the possums because there are no possum fodder trees. The council has removed a significant... Both sides come out fighting as the possums of Curtin Square become an election issue. The fate of these possums seems held by a thread. In inner city suburbs like North Carlton, it's crucial to have as much of this habitat as possible, not only for the, for the wildlife that it supports, but also for the people that it supports. It's really not their fault that they're a possum. It's not their fault that they can get to high density, but there is a good place here for some wildlife management of some sort. These are animals that seem to have adapted to an urban lifestyle very, very successfully. Ultimately, there is a lot of anti-possum sentiment, not only in this area, but in the Australian community in general. If we cannot do it here, if we cannot do it in Carlton North, of all places, it cannot be done anywhere else in Australia. With wild possums under threat of starvation, one little orphan has central heating and 24-hour care. So how many do you have at the moment? Beetle. Uh, She's now six months old. Chris and Jody have invited the couple round that found her trapped in their house and saved her life. So, so Beagle, it's an emotional reunion. The Beagle and this um, brother sticks are in here. <gasps> oh, they're up. That's Beetle. Beetle. Oh, my God. Hello. Do you remember us? This is a special occasion for Beetle, but so brief. Yeah. It's important that rescued animals don't get handled too much. They need to be wild creatures first sign of recovery is they get the instincts back and they'll bite you and um, everyone's normally happy when the possum gives the carer a bite because it means that you know they're almost ready to go back to the wild. All going well, in two months time beetle and stick should be big and healthy enough to join the other wild possums. Scamp has fallen on her feet and has made the roof of number 26 her home for the last month. She's been very lucky, but Scamp's co-tenants underneath are getting on much less well. Just up the street and dinner is waiting. A salad of fresh pink roses. It's great that Scamp's not eating junk food anymore, but her midnight feast is losing her friends among local gardeners. It's always um, a challenge to talk about possums. Last week, I went to the garden at night and I was counting, I think there are about 13 possums in the backyard at night and it's a real problem there. Some of the camellia lovers are a bit anti-possum because they get, get them ready for the show and they go out to get them and the possums nibble them off. <laughs> they don't just attack one, one plant, they'll go through the whole lot and in a space of one night, they could ruin about 10 plants. We let them eat what they have and we have the rest and between us, we live quite well together. <laughs> <laughs> for the time being. <laughs> incredibly distressing to go out and find that animals have browsed off your roses or damaged your veggie patch. At the other end of the, of the extreme is people rightly say, we've moved into their environment and so they have a right to live here. We'll never satisfy both ends of that polarised view, but most people find native wildlife quite enchanting. It is. I mean, I've been working with these sorts of animals for a very long time and I still think they're fantastic little animals. That's not to say they don't annoy people with some of their bad habits. It's now summer in Melbourne and people are taking advantage of the warmer weather. 
but there's no holiday yet for Chris and Jodie. Beetle and her buddy sticks are now fit and healthy enough to be released. Although possums should be returned to the place that they were found, Chris and Jodie have decided it's best for Beetle not to go back to the inner city. There are so many struggling possums already there. Talk about Fitzroy, where Beetle came from, or the Exhibition Gardens, where Sticks came from. I mean, there's no way you're going to be taking it back there. Um, they're just, they'll be dead within two days or a week. So we've had to make a choice and find this carer down here and quite away from Melbourne. It's a rural environment. She does soft releases, and you now we'll take that. So the two possums are heading to a remote wildlife sanctuary. They will gradually be introduced to the sights, sounds and smells of their natural home. Meanwhile, at Curtin Square, the council elections resulted in both good and bad news for the supporters of the park's possums. The council is rethinking the idea of introducing the fertility control program, but the ban on feeding still remains. Raya breaks the law most nights and the possums get fed. Until there's enough natural food in the park, she's vowed to continue. If we obey this bylaw and avoid fines, we'll be abandoning the possums to starvation. If we don't obey the bylaw, we'll be accruing fines and ending up in court. So for us, it's between a rock and a hard place. For Mumsy, who's seen so many changes, the story isn't yet over. Buster, Mumsy's 12th baby, will be leaving home soon. Maybe 12 is enough. If the possums get contraceptive implants, he'll be her last. Meanwhile, Scamp is still living it up and can't help but cause trouble. First thing tomorrow, I'm doing something about that possum. Hello, Paul. Possum catcher. And with lots of other scamps out there causing mayhem in the suburbs, Paul the Possum Catcher continues to get swamped with calls. Yeah, I'm good, mate. But um, look, what I really want to know is, can you come around today? That possum kept us up again last night and it's driving us mad. Beetle and Sticks arrive, smelling the bush for the first time. Look at all the parrots. What sort of parrots are those, Kate? Kings. They're beauties. Isolated in the hills of eastern Victoria, Kate Harden has 30 rescued or orphaned possums lucky enough to be in her care. Well, that's good honey. Mmm. That's mm. great. It's from the local area. Mmm, that's really good. <laughs> in one month's time, Beetle and Sticks will move into this larger enclosure ready to begin the process of moving out into the surrounding wilderness. I notice there's the flaps up there so they can come and go. That's right. In the night it's open and in the morning they can come back if they want to. Yeah. And sleep in a box in here. Oh, so they're a little bit stressed oh, because of the drive, but that's uh, Beetle and Styx has the bigger eyes. He's the male and she's the female. Okay. Gorgeous little possums. Now it's time to say goodbye. After nearly five months of devoted care. Oh, it's okay. Out of all our possums, these two have been the most loved and looked after, and now are given a future. The city possums depend on the people who care about them and help shape their future. But the possum wars of Curtin Square aren't over yet. <laughs>